Welcome to the City Church Podcast. We hope that you will be abundantly blessed by this message. If you would like to find out more about the city, please log on to our website, www.thecity.sg. Jesus, we thank you once again for the privilege of gathering in your house and gathering together as saints. God, we thank you for the privilege of being in your presence. And God, we ask that we will not be callous to the fact that we get to stand before the throne of grace this morning. We will not be callous to the lyrics that we sing about the cross, about mercy, about the greatest price that's been paid on our behalf. And God, we, we ask that we will live lives of passion, of response to your worth, God. That we will not be indifferent, passive toward your word and toward your presence. God, I even ask that this morning you will do a work in all of our hearts, myself included, that we will not be passive, indifferent, ignorant of the price, the beauty, the worth that is before us. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. And God, I ask for your spirit to come upon this place in a mighty, mighty way. For it's by your spirit that hearts are transformed. Not by the eloquence of my speech, not by the depth of my research. But it's in your presence and by your spirit that lives are changed. So we yield to you this morning, Holy Spirit. We ask that you have your way. We thank you, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Well, like all good pulpit Andre stories. Two weeks ago, I went to CrossFit and uh, John was a part of that. Uh, my brother was a part of that. Uh, Shren was a part of that. And so four of us went to CrossFit. And uh, it, was, it was a pretty, you know, light workout. You know, the person came in and was like, oh, today is an easy day. And I'm like, oh, yeah, you know, I, I believe you. And we did the easy workout. And I left feeling like not even half, like 25% of a man, you know, I was like, oh my gosh. And then I, I described the whole uh, experience as uh, excruciating. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm in so much pain. And by no means am I comparing uh, my CrossFit experience to the cross. It's, <laughs> this is not what bearing a cross looks like. Yeah, so... But, you know, it's interesting. Like, I was uh, doing a bit of uh, research and... Uh, I don't know, I just chanced upon this um, little uh, thing that someone put on Facebook. The person was like, you know, the word excruciate literally comes from uh, the words torment on the cross. Torment on the cross. And, uh, and then I was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to use a different word to describe my pain the next time. It's not torment on the cross kind of level of pain. It's more like Andre got pricked by a toothpick kind of pain. And so, and so I was like, my gosh, that's what the word excruciating means. You know, it, it literally comes from the words being tormented on the cross. And how many of you know that Jesus experienced tremendous pain on the cross? You know, um, it, you know if you study you know, um, the cross from a medical standpoint, you would, you would of course know that Jesus was nailed. You know, his hands were, were stretched out. He was stretched out this way and he was nailed on the cross. And his feet was nailed in the same manner on the cross. And, um, and, you know, the cross was designed you know, to, to prolong suffering and pain. People weren't, uh, didn't die immediately after being nailed to the cross. You know, some of them would live on for days. But, you know, they, it's, it's a sickening and a really uh, punishing kind of uh, uh, method of, you know, um, of punishing someone. You know, it's, it, it, people would die from suffocation. By being on a cross, and this was this is why you know because whenever they took a breath, you know, on the cross, they will put pressure on their hands, and when they breathed out, they will put pressure on their feet, and so every breath was rotating between excruciating pain and excruciating pain, followed by excruciating pain and excruciating pain. It never ended, and that was the the. Sickness, you know, the, uh, that was why the cross was so sadistic in nature. It was designed to prolong suffering, and every breath that our Messiah took on the cross was one of infinite pain, pain that you cannot even imagine. 
every breath was one filled with pain. No, but on on that cross, you know, and this is why we're doing the series, Jesus uttered seven things on the cross. See, it took him tremendous effort to even breathe. One more to speak the words he spoke. And that is why we are paying incredible attention to the things that Jesus said on the cross. And there are seven in total, and we are going to take the next seven weeks to to go through each and every single one of them. But I want to to start this thing within you of value for the words of Jesus, especially the words he spoke on the cross, because it took him tremendous effort. He had to work through tremendous pain to say the things he said. Amen? And so we're going to look at Luke chapter 23 this morning, and we're going to explore the second word that Jesus spoke on the cross. How many of you are with me? Yes? Like my CrossFit story? John, we need to find alternatives. <laughs> so if you know of uh, any workout that is... Uh, I mean, I'm not, you know, really... Uh, I'm not so idealistic. I understand that there's going to be a little pain involved, but let's make it manageable, shall we? Huh? Right? Amen. Hallelujah. Okay, Luke chapter 23. Let's look at it. And uh, we're going to explore uh, the second word that Jesus spoke on the cross. Are you ready? Let's read it. Together, And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. And the people stood by watching, but the ruler scoffed at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. And we explored this verse last week and we talked about forgiveness and we talked about how forgiveness is really the intrinsic quality of a Christian. Because our Messiah bore the cross in a unique fashion, not with words of hate and words of revenge, but he bore it with love and forgiveness, even for the ones who crucified him. And that is why as believers, as Christians, we are called to love and forgive our enemies, even those who refuse to repent, even those who are not worthy and deserving of forgiveness because that is what our Messiah did on the cross. Let's move on and, and read the rest of the passage. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him saying, this is the king of the Jews. Next slide. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him saying, Do you not fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said to Jesus, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to this man, this criminal who hung on the cross next to him, he said this, Truly, I say to you, today you'll be with me in paradise. Jesus said, truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. And the second word that we're going to explore from the cross is the word of salvation. Everybody say salvation. salvation. Come on, say it louder. Salvation. salvation. So who was this criminal you know, who... Uh, was crucified next to Jesus on the cross, who was a, a part of uh, Calvary, who suffered alongside Jesus for his crimes, suffered next to the innocent Messiah. And translators use different words to describe these men. You know, they, they call them thieves, robbers, bandits. And Luke's word actually means members of the criminal class, professional criminals. And it's an extremely fascinating story because, you know, we're reading from Luke. But if you read it from uh, the account of Matthew, you will realize that these two thieves were actually part of the crowd who mocked Jesus as he took on the cross. They were part of insulting the Messiah. They were part of speaking words of hate against him. These two men who were crucified next to Jesus were part of the entire process of shaming, of rebuking, of mocking the Messiah. 
And when we read this story in Luke, it was almost as though one of the criminals had a sudden revelation, had a sudden shift in perspective, had a sudden awakening in his heart, and all of a sudden he goes, no, 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 no. Do you not recognize that this man is the Christ? He has done nothing wrong. And then he looks at Jesus and says, Jesus, remember me when you enter into your kingdom. And then Jesus said, you will be with me in paradise. You are forgiven. You are saved. A wretched man, guilty, deserving of death, found forgiveness, deliverance, and ultimately salvation at a cross. He has spent his entire life in utter rebellion, but happened to have a few minutes of repentance at the end. He who had defamed God with a lifetime of breaths, but happened to use his last breath for mercy. And Christ tells him, today you will be with me in paradise. I love this quote from Pope Francis. Pope Francis says this. He says, God does not only forgive our incalculable debts, he also enables us to move directly from the most shameful disgrace to the highest dignity without any intermediary stages. From our moments of shame, from our place of guilt and condemnation, Christ lifts us up into the highest form of dignity, being a part of his kingdom, that truly you and I have been saved from darkness and now we enter into his marvelous light. That's the work of salvation. You know, some writers even suggest that these men were political revolutionaries bent on overthrowing the yoke of the Roman rule. If so, we ought to think of them as terrorists who thought nothing of using violence to achieve their political aims. They were like terrorists who used violence, who who warred against the, the government of that day. They're like terrorists. And then this man who is political revolutionary, a terrorist who is crucified next to Jesus for his crimes, his own sin, turns to him, Jesus and says, Lord, forgive me. In his last breath, in his final breaths, he turns to Jesus and says, forgive me. And Jesus says to him, you'll be with me in paradise. Let's put it into today's context. Think of the most vile, disgusting, evil human being on the planet today. Think of a terrorist who has killed countless of lives. If that terrorist, in his final breath, were to acknowledge Jesus as Messiah, he would be saved. And that is offensive. That's offensive to you and me. We have done the church thing. We serve in ministry. Lord, I've devoted half my life toward you. And this clown, this fella, who is an evil person all his life, in his final breath, he asks for forgiveness and you forgive him? He doesn't deserve that. How many of you remember the story of the prodigal son? That son who squandered his father's wealth. That son who was honestly an evil person. And then he comes back into his father's forgiveness. Beautiful story, but there's another character in that story, and that's the older brother. The one who took offense at that outrageous love that was displayed. The word prodigal means extravagant. And to be honest, when I look at the story, I'm more drawn to the prodigal, extravagant love of the father than the sin of the son. Is offensive to you and me, this gospel. And in the same way, the older brother was inclined towards offense. So, so would you and me. In recognizing that this gospel is that beautiful, that scandalous, and that offensive. You know, I remember this story when I was in secondary school. Uh, me and Axel, I think Axel was there. Of course, Axel will be there. And uh, me and Axel and a few of our friends were playing near the stairs, like all brilliant people. And so we were playing near the stairs, and all of a sudden, I tripped over one of my friends. You were there for that, right? No, you weren't. Uh, so I, I tripped over one of my friends, and I started rolling down the stairs. And I was rolling and rolling and rolling, and, and you know, I was like, 
rolling all over. And it was a long flight of stairs. And so I was rolling down the stairs. And as I got to the bottom, all of a sudden, man, I don't know what happened. It might be angels. It might be my athleticism, if you can imagine. And I was rolling down. And all of a sudden, I landed at the bottom of the stairs, Terminator style. So it's like kneeling on the ground with one hand on my, on my, on my forehead. And I, and I got there. I was like, oh my gosh. And so I was rolling down. And then I landed gracefully. And then this teacher came up to me and was like, hey! Why you do stun? And I was like, so first of all, I was stunned that I was alive. And then this teacher calls me and grabs me and calls me and says, why you do stun? Huh? Do you know how dangerous this is? And I was like, so I don't know where to start. You know, I was like, my friend, uh. so then I was like, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> why, why did I bring up this story? Sometimes, Falling and recovering graciously can be offensive to some. Whoa. <laughs> you will forever remember that point. <laughs> it's true, right? Sometimes we, we look at people who have left, you know, uh, church or have uh, adopted uh, wayward lifestyles and they come back to church and, and they find acceptance, you know, and they come into a place of acceptance and welcome and love and they are thrust into ministry once again and we take offense. We're like, that person doesn't deserve that. But here's the, the, the sobering news for you and me. Neither did we. Neither did we, you know. It says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The sin that, that so entraps that person who you regard as evil has entrapped you at one point. Neither did you deserve it. So I love this hymn. It says this, The dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day. And there may I, though vow as he, wash all my sins away. The thief recognizes depravity, he recognizes wretchedness, and then he asks the Messiah, remember me. Remember me. And I love this story, you know, because, you know, I, I've been so fascinated by this interaction because the, that criminal, that, that guilty man on the cross, he didn't go to Jesus like, Jesus, Save me from this cross. It hurts. No, he, he said, remember me in your kingdom. Remember me in eternity. This man, though vile, though, though he was a criminal, had a concept of eternity. He had an understanding of a punishment that was far worse, far more harsh, painful than one that he was experiencing right there and then. He had a concept of eternity. And to the Jew, hell was a really real place. You know, when Jesus mentions the word hell, he uses the word Gehenna, which comes from the words Ge and Hannah, which translates to the Valley of Hinnom. And the Valley of Hinnom was a place outside of the town of Jerusalem where they would burn the city's trash and so they would take all the trash and that fire would burn day and night, night and day. And uh, stray animals would, would often wander to that dump and fight over scraps of food. And you would hear the gnashing of teeth every night. And so they had a picture of what hell could possibly look like. Because Jesus put it in the, in the context of that day. It looks like that. It looks like a fire that never stops burning. It looks like pain. It looks like being outcasted and ostracized, left out. That was what hell looked like. So they had a concept, an understanding of how real hell was and they, had, they wanted no part of it. They had an understanding of eternity and my question to you this morning is, do you have a concept of eternity in this life? 
Do you understand that your actions or your inactions today will ripple into your eternal destiny? Do you understand that? And that's the beauty of salvation, you know. It's in a moment we are secured with the knowledge that we get to spend eternity with Jesus, that we get to escape that horrific fate of those who transgressed against the Lord. And that, no, I would say is really why most of us are here this morning, because someone came to us and informed us that, hey, this hell, really, really bad place. You don't want any part of it. And then we're like, I agree. How do I get out of this thing? And then we're like, be a Christian. And we're like, okay, I Christian you too. And so, you know, you, you say, okay, I'll, I'll be a Christian. And to us, you know, when we first got saved, it was like a get out of hell card, to be honest, right? You know, it's like, I don't want this hell thing. And it's like, okay, I'll be a Christian. And I get to move past that. But the gospel of Christ Salvation is so much more than getting out of hell. If we reduce the gospel message to if you don't believe in Jesus, you go to hell, we reduce it from good news to a death threat. People will get converted out of fear instead of love. I'm making sense to you this morning. We are familiar with the phrasing turn or burn, but though it's true in every extent of the word is not the gospel to its full extent. If I was a, a father and I have my child described who I am to him, to you, and he were to say, that's my father, Andre, he's my disciplinarian. Though it's true in every sense of the word, it's not true in its entirety. I'm making sense. Though that is an essential key piece of the gospel message is not the fullness to which we are called to experience. I'm making sense. I've often pondered and wondered how amazing and how attractive and how worthy this gospel actually is. You know, if you were to study church history, you don't even need to study church history. Just take a look at missionaries all around the world. You know, it's fascinating to me that all of Jesus' disciples, with the exception of John, died horrific deaths in the defense, in the proclamation of this gospel. And from that point, thousands, thousands of others have followed suit giving their lives for the sake of this gospel. You know, I've often asked myself a question like, do I put such worth, beauty, and value in the gospel message that I would be willing to do the same? And if I'm not able to come to that place, then perhaps it's less responsibility on the beauty of the message as supposed to responsibility on me not knowing how great it actually is. Perhaps I have an incomplete understanding of what the gospel is. Perhaps you and me, we have an incomplete understanding, an incomplete revelation of how beautiful this good news actually is. See, passion is an automatic response to something you attribute worth to. The deficiency is not on your passion level. The deficiency is on your understanding, your revelation. Come on. This gospel is it's beautiful. It's so much more than what I've come to understand, what we have understand collectively as a church. And today I want to I wanna talk a bit. I think is this is just a, 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 it's still incomplete. It's still not the full thing, but it's something that we have overlooked as a church 
regards to what the gospel actually is. You know, I have the question that, that you know, some of you might be wondering, but it's a question I often ask myself. If that guy, that vile creature person, can profess Christ in his last breath and make it into the same place I'm going, then what's the point of being a Christian now? What's the point of going to church now? When I can just remind myself before I die, say the prayer and make it there. How many of you have ever wondered that? Just me? Just me? Just Andre? Okay, just Andre. Andre, you vile creature. <laughs> right? What's the point? Should there, is there more to Christianity than just that goal of getting out of hell? Is there more to the gospel that we have actually interacted with? Are we just scratching the surface? Come on. We are all familiar with this verse, John 3.16. You know, and we can quote it. It says, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whosoever believes in Him will not perish but have eternal life. And that is, uh, our understanding of this scripture is, eternal life means heaven. It means a mansion. It means I get a heated swimming pool in heaven. You know, if I do good as a Christian, I'll get prime real estate. I'll have a beachfront property overlooking the sea of glass. I'll have perfect view of the throne of God. I don't even need to get out of my house. I can just worship from my window. And that's our understanding of heaven, right? Mansions, uh, it's going to be cool. It's going to be chill. You know, (laughs) you attained it out of life, you know, and That's our understanding of eternal life, right? It's an eventual destination. But to the Jew, when they were to read those words, it didn't look like something in the future. It looked like something they could experience here and now. And if you were to pay attention and and study and read the way the Jews read the Bible, they understood life as something you can experience here and now. That's why Jesus says that, that the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come to give you life and life more abundantly. I think we are guilty of pushing the promises of God into the future, contradicting what the cross has actually paid for you and me. We push these things in the future, not recognizing that these things can be experienced in the here and now. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Eternal life is something we can experience here. You know, and we often read this verse and we stop right there. You know, but can I encourage you, just go down a few more chapters and Jesus himself will explain to you what eternal life actually means. Next verse in John 17, it says this, and this is eternal life, that they know you the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Eternal life is knowing God. Eternal life is pursuing a relationship with God. It's not simply escaping a horrific eternal destiny, but it's an invitation into knowing the Christ, into knowing the Messiah. Come on, am I preaching to you? Jesus says to the thief, today you will be with me in paradise. And paradise is mentioned a couple times in the Bible and it's in reference to Eden, the garden of Eden where man fell. But it's also in reference to the paradise that we'll experience in the book of Revelations. And people have often speculated, where is this paradise? Where is it? Here, up, there, left, right. Where is this paradise? I don't even bother, you know. But I know one thing is consistent with that word paradise. Paradise is a place where Jesus is. I want to put it to you this morning that heaven is not simply a place in the clouds, but heaven is where Jesus is. I don't want heaven if Jesus is not there. This is eternal life. Eternal life is an invitation into 
No way. The Christ. For the Christian, heaven is where Jesus is. We do not need to speculate on what heaven will be like. It's enough to know that we will be with him forever. This is what Jesus promised to that hardened criminal. Today you will be with me in paradise. He didn't say today you will get into paradise. We have an above ground swimming pool. It's going to be great. You know, we have a room for you to gym in. Just automatic six packs. Don't need to go that CrossFit nonsense. (laughs) No, he says you'll be with me in paradise. I want to run through a few scriptures. I know I'm taking too long, but but are you all with me? Great. You are with me. (laughs) Let's run through all these scriptures, okay? Let's, Let's go through them. Next slide. Ephesians 2 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. You have been saved. This is salvation in its past tense. Next slide. Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed, being saved day by day. This is salvation in its present tense. Next slide. Come on. Through faith, we are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. This is salvation in its future tense. Past, present, future. Salvation is something that we have experienced, we are experiencing, and we're going to experience. It's not a one-off event. You didn't experience salvation in one moment. You're still experiencing it today. It's something that we continually experience. It's so beautiful. Life is all about knowing God and knowing Him deeper and deeper and deeper. You must understand that to the Jew hearing the words, you get to know God. It's an extremely mind-blowing thing. And the modern-day church today, you know, we have almost become callous to that fact, callous to that privilege. To the Jew, this is God whom you have to perform countless ceremonial practices, cleansing, adhering to this and that in order to have access to. God whom only the high priest was allowed to offer the sacrifice. God who was silent for over 400 years between Malachi and Matthew. God who was shrouded in mystery called the unsearchable, unknowable one. God whose name cannot even be mentioned. If you were to write his name on a piece of paper in that day, you would have to take that pen immediately and burn it ceremoniously and use a new pen to carry on writing. That God wants to be known by you. My word. (laughs) That's the gospel. He was behind a curtain. He was within the confines of a temple. He He was in a tent. That God wants to be known by you. The temple, which was symbolic of a meeting place between God and man, was torn down, was destroyed. And Jesus said, in three days, I will raise up a new temple. And in three days, our Messiah rose again. And now Christ is in you. You have access. It's a privilege, come on. It's, it's the gospel. So why men gave up their lives for this? It's knowing God. You know, the second coming will be the most glorious day we will ever experience. It's going to be beautiful. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be a day where the fullness of God's glory will be unveiled to men, where we will be with him face to face. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be glorious. But I want to say something slightly controversial. You might not agree fully with me, but I personally think that there are aspects of God, flavorings, if you would, to his nature that we can only experience while we're on earth. When he returns, there is 
no longer pain, no longer weeping, no longer mourning. Everything will be made new, will be restored. Perhaps, you know, it's only in this life that we will get to know him in the midst of pain, in the midst of uncertainty. In that day, everything, is, everything will be made known. But perhaps there are aspects of his nature that we can only encounter on earth. You might agree with me, you might not, but that's what I believe. And I have the mic, so. <laughs> are you with me this morning? Bible says this, no, it's the glory of God to conceal a matter, it's the glory of kings to search it out. In that day, all will be revealed. But in this life, we get to partake of what the Bible describes as the glory of kings and look for God and pursue Him. It's a lifelong pursuit. Just like the knowledge of Him is inexhaustible, so will our pursuit of Him be. We can never exhaust this subject. The Bible will go on to say, you know, seek first the kingdom of God. Seek and you shall find. Have you been seeking? Have you been earnestly pursuing the knowledge of Him? It's like Christian Where's Waldo, you know. It's looking for God. It's finding I'm, I'm brilliant at Where's, Where's Waldo. I just, I got Waldo's number. I know where Waldo is all the time. <laughs> Most of you, do you not know what Where's Waldo? Is it a very dated reference? I'm sorry, I want to be relevant and youthful. <laughs> you know, and today I'm just going to share three points, you know, uh, just three simple things, and I, I promise I, I will endeavor to end on time. But uh, is this benefiting you? Yeah. Yes. You know, I'm of the opinion that you rarely see what you're not looking out for. And I'm going to expound on that, you know, we expect to see God in you know, reading of the word when we come to church. But, you know, God is so much bigger than this institution we call it church. God is so much bigger than our Sunday gathering. You know, and I found, you know, in my life that, that God is found in certain places. He, he just is there. You know, and I've, I've gone to these places, you know, in my uncertainty, in my doubt, in my fear, and find Him there time and time again. And today I'm just going to share a piece of my own life. Is that, is that fine? It's not, it's not a teaching, you know. It's just it's Andre's life. And I found God in these three places. And today I just want to share three places to find God. And this is no, by no means inexhaustible, but this is just a personal experience. And I found God in these places again and again and again. And the first place I often find God is in this thing that we talk often and we profess to do often. It is, it's this thing called fellowship. Fellowship. Let's read uh, the passages of scriptures in Luke. And, uh, you know, just a, a bit of context to this story. This, this uh, chapter actually happens post-resurrection. So Jesus has already risen from the grave. He is victorious. He is risen. And it's, it's amazing. But these two uh, people, we don't know uh, for sure you know, whether a man or a woman, woman and a woman, or man and a man, woman and a man. We, we really don't know who they are. But, but you know, it's this story that is called uh, the story of the road to Emmaus. And these two people were leaving Jerusalem, they were going away and they were doing so presumably out of fear. Out of fear. And so the Bible says that they were seven miles away from Jerusalem on a road to this place called Emmaus. And Emmaus, if you were to try and look for it today, you wouldn't be able to find it. Because it's so insignificant, it's so small, that people don't really know where Emmaus actually is. If someone tells you they know where Emmaus is, they are actually lying. And you should pray for them. And so Emmaus is so insignificant, it's so small, so unheard of, that it will be a fantastic place to hide, to run away. And so these two people were leaving Jerusalem and they were on their road to Emmaus. And, and I love this story, you know. Uh, Jesus then goes up to them and was like, goes up. 
I'm Jesus. And then they, they start talking to Jesus about Jesus. Read the story. It's, it's extremely fascinating. And, and, you know, they had the risen Christ right before their eyes. But they couldn't recognize Him. And then, you know, we find ourselves in this verse. It says this, Then they, the two, drew near to the village where they were going, and He indicated that He would have gone further, but they constrained Him, Jesus saying, Abide with us, for it's toward evening, and the day is far spent. And He went in to stay with them. Now it came to pass as He sat at the table with them. There He took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. Next slide. And they said to one another, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us on the road, while he opened the scriptures to us? So they rose up that day in that very hour, and he returned. they returned to Jerusalem and found the 11 disciples and those who were with them gathered together saying, the Lord is risen indeed, and he has appeared. Simon, and they told about the things that had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. That's a vision for what our fellowship ought to look like. It's found in the opening of Scripture. It's found when we have conversations about the Bible, about how the Word of God has impacted us. It's found in the blessing and breaking of bread, which we understand today as communion, but communion is so much more than just eating a light snack in church. Communion is remembering Christ. Do this in remembrance of me. And that is what the Bible casts as a vision for what our fellowship ought to look like. Scriptures in remembering Christ. And the beauty of that is that in that environment of faith, their eyes were opened. But as they opened the scripture, as they they remembered Christ, their eyes were opened. And these two men who were running away from Jerusalem in fear, who were going to hide, their eyes were opened and they knew him. What if that's the fellowship that you and I are called to model? What if that's the environment that we're called to build together? One where those far off from God, those running away in fear, will come into our environment and they will see Him. That their hearts will burn once again. Now I'll pose that question to you. Do you have a structure of fellowship in your life? Are you actively seeking those whom you are called to commune with through scripture, through remembering him, so that your heart can burn once again? Passion is your responsibility. You don't just stir it up. You put things in place. Fellowship is one of them. I'm making sense. I'm just going to cut short. Let's, let's go to the next place that I often find God. It's this thing called stillness. I often find God in stillness. Psalms 46 verse 10, it says this, Be still and know that I am God. It's in stillness that we know God. You know, I, I've asked one of my mentors once, you know, he's a great speaker, and I asked him, how do you grow in revelation, how do you grow in your understanding of God? So how do you grow in relationship with God? And he, he said this to me, I, I meditate on God's word. And that was what God told Joshua, you know, as he assumed command. He says, Joshua, Joshua, meditate on the word day and night. Do not let it depart from you. And many times when we read the Bible, we read it to fulfill a spiritual, a spiritual religious quota. You know, Once I get three chapters knocked off, I'm cleansed by his word. Amen, hallelujah, I've done my, i paid my dues time after time. You know, and, and we're like, I'm done, it's, it's settled. But that's not how we're supposed to read the Bible. It's not quantity, but it's encountering him through his word. 
And meditation looks like taking that word and, and putting it in your mind and, and bringing it up time and time again. You know, it's, it's, it's interesting that that word meditation is, it has its roots in, it, it looks as though, uh, it looks like a cow chewing grass and, and he, he chews it, he, he digests it, he chews it again and again, absorbs the flavor, swallows it, and then he brings it up again, and then he chews it. You know, that's how we're supposed to eat steak. You know, you don't shove steak down your throat and not chew. You chew, you let the fattiness, the liquid, just seep in. Medium rare is the way you're meant to eat it. It's the way God intended for you to eat steak. And so you, you eat it, you chew, the, the juices seep, and then you swallow it, and then you bring it back up. Into your, no, I'm just kidding. Don't do that, that's gross. God wants us to restore the lost art of meditation and stillness. In Psalm 77, it says this, I call to remembrance my song in the night. I will meditate within my heart and my spirit makes diligent search. Psalms 27 verse 4, we know we're familiar. There's one thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His temple. When we think of the word meditation, we think empty your thoughts, put your finger out, and hum. Mm. But the Bible describes meditation differently. Meditation isn't about emptying your mind, it's about filling your mind with the things of God. And it's not just stopping there. Our concept of stillness is, I just lie there. I lie on my green pasture, the Lord have His way with me. No. It says, that one thing I ask to dwell in His house to make a diligent search and to inquire in His temple. We need to develop a culture of question. The, to, the modern day church you know, looks often like the pastor telling you what to think. Think these things because I pastor, I tell you. <laughs> My job isn't to replace the Holy Spirit in your life. My job is to direct you to Him. I am of the opinion that you're supposed to leave this place with more questions than information. <laughs> so can I just say more controversial things as we go on in the weeks? <laughs> just say very like, oh my gosh, is that... Questions. <laughs> questions are really an invitation to connection. It's an invitation to inner mercy. Right? We know God not through vain repetitions. It's often what most prayer lives look like, vain repetitions. But we know Him by coming into His presence with uncertainties, with questions. Prayer is meant to be a dialogue, not a monologue. Okay. <laughs> we have five more minutes. It's interesting that the Hebrew word for be still actually translates to the word rafa, which means to be weak. Be weak and know that I am God. I'm going to run through this point really quick, but I think there are some aspects of God's nature that you'll only encounter in weakness. You will never know Him as healer unless you need a healing. You will never know Him as provider unless you need provision. There is no test without testimony, no victory without a battle, and no miracle without an impossible circumstance. I wish I had more time. This place, I've often tried to avoid, but it's a place I find God time and time again. And you see Jesus being found in this place again and again and again in scriptures. And it's in this place called suffering. God is found in suffering. I'm going to read from Philippians 3 in this moment, in just a moment, and I want to I'll give you a bit of context. Philippians is known as the most upbeat and happy letter that Paul ever wrote. And uh, that, it's honestly not very happy, but it's the happier one <laughs> that, that Paul has ever written. And uh, really, theologians say that it's the most upbeat and happy <laughs> letter that Paul has written. It is funny that Paul is actually writing this letter to the church of Philippi from prison. 
The church in Philippi was the first church that Paul planted in modern-day Europe. It was doing well, it was fruitful. Though there were some disagreements within the ranks pertaining to certain matters of theology, Paul addresses them in this letter. And we read from Philippians that the church in Philippi is actually the main church that is financially supporting Paul's ministry. They were giving and funding him. And so this was a church that was doing well. They were paying their dues. They were giving to missionaries, much like most churches today. And Paul writes this in Philippians 3. It says, But what things were gained to me? These I have counted lost for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in Him. That's what we want. Not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is true faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. The fellowship of his sufferings. You know, we, today, you know, most people read that verse and they have, a, honestly, a very dysfunctional way of reading that verse. You know, you have monks who would flog themselves, whip themselves, like, I am suffering with Christ. You know, you have people who would nail themselves to a cross, you know, out of professed devotion to the Lord and like, I'm fellowshipping in the suffering. You know, oftentimes those acts are rooted in some manner of atonement. I want to atone for my sin, therefore I inflict pain on myself. And that is a direct contradiction and a slap in the face in what Jesus accomplished on the cross for you and me. Fellowshipping and suffering is not putting yourself through senseless abuse and violence. It's messed up. So what does it mean to fellowship in suffering? There are many interpretations but my personal interpretation is this. We fellowship, we sit with, we commune with those who suffer. Matthew 25 says this. Let's look at Matthew 25. Then the king will say, Jesus will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Is there another slide? Then they will also will answer him saying, Lord, when... Did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them saying, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of this, you did not do it to me and these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. It's in this life that we get to serve Jesus as the one who is naked. As the one who is weak, as the one who is hungry, as the one who is thirsty, as the one who is in need, as the one who is suffering. Inasmuch as we do it to the least of these, we do it unto him. I want to read an, another passage of scripture in 1 Corinthians 12. But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If there were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. We see it in the context of spiritual gifts, but can I, just for one Sunday, take this out of its context? And put it into your context. Those who are weaker, those who are suffering, those who are in need, they're not dispensable. They're indispensable. You know, there's this auntie that, that uh, you know, if you work in the CBD, you'll see her. She is often at the MRT station. She moves around a lot. But she has this sign that says, don't score me. Uh, and, and it's a long list of words, don't score me. I'm only here to... to uh, get money from my husband, and it's a long list of words, and I honestly didn't read all the words because they were very small and my eyesight is really bad. And uh, there was one Monday I came back to the office, surprised to run. Oh. And I was, uh, I was uh, going to run, and, um, and as I was uh, making my way to my running spot, uh, I saw that auntie, you know, and, 
And uh, I, I walked up to her and I was like, hey, you know, I have some money for you. And so I took out all that, was, all that I had, you know, uh, in, my, in my pockets and I gave it to her. And then I, I did my run, you know. And as I was running, I just had this feeling of like, you know, that's, that's, that's got to be more, you know, than, than, than what I'm doing, you know. And so I, I ran back, you know, um, after a while, after 10 minutes of running, because I was done with my run. <laughs> and uh, I, sound, I just sound like a horribly unhealthy person, don't I? <laughs> and so I, I was running back. Are you all with me? I, I'm so sorry I'm going along. But I, I was running back, and then uh, I, I went up to her, and, uh, and uh, I was like, uh, Auntie, how are you? Like, you know, it's pretty late. Are you going to go home soon? She's like, no, I, I haven't gotten enough money. And so I sat at the steps with her, and I just talked to her for, for a bit, you know, and, uh, and uh, got to hear a story. You know, she, she, has, she has a husband who uh, has been a stroke patient for 37 years. 37 years, the, the, her husband has not been working and uh, has been, you know, um, relying on uh, government support. And uh, she told me that, you know, doctors have given up on him. The government has given up on him, but I'm not going to give up on him. I'm going to do all I can to make sure he recovers. I'm not going to give up on him. And so I sat there, you know, um, thoroughly impacted by whatever I just heard. You see, I don't think I would have had a revelation for a love that would persevere through adversity had I not sat at those very steps. Perhaps, you know, in your life, you might not go through the sufferings that that lady would go through. But if you were to take a moment and sit with those who suffer, you might just well get a revelation of who God is and know Him in a deeper level. If you were to just take a moment. For this present suffering pales in comparison to the future glory that's about to be revealed. When we sit with those who suffer, we get to partake in that glory. And that glory is not fame, it's not acclaim, it's not reward. That glory, it's knowing Him. Do it unto the least of this. We do it unto Him. You know, I think we all give a certain amount to missions and to different church initiatives. But Jesus just doesn't draw a distinction in the kingdom of God between those who are called to give and those who are called to do the work of the kingdom. It's a disservice from me to you if I tell you that all you have to do is give money you don't have to get your hands dirty. And that's the kingdom of God. You're mistaken. Give. Bless but be willing to sit with those who suffer. We all know Sodom and Gomorrah, that, that story of Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, horrific, you know, uh, sinful city. They were godless in all their, their doings. You know. And Ezekiel, you know, he would write about the city of Sodom and he would describe the sin of Sodom as such. That verse is this. In Ezekiel 16, verse 49. Now this was the sin of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters were arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned. They did not help the poor and needy. Perhaps ungodliness is not limited to moral, spiritual sin. Perhaps ungodliness looks like indifference. And perhaps godliness looks like actually bothering, actually taking time. If you're callous to the poor, if you can walk past the poor, you're callous to Jesus. Because when you do it on the least of these, you do it unto him. And when you choose to partake in suffering, when you choose to sit and minister to those who are in lack, you know him. He is there. Amen. Can we all stand? Amen, amen. Come on. Now, I came across this uh, article fairly recently. As it's from this uh, CEO of a company named VMware, one of the top companies in Silicon Valley. And it says this in this article. It says, The richest area on earth, referring to Silicon Valley, is one of the least philanthropic areas on earth. 
Gelsinger said, the fact that we can say we can, we have the highest per capita income in the world and one of the lowest giving rates in the United States, this is impossible. Gelsinger has a theory that explains why Silicon Valley is so bad at giving money to charity. His theory includes two reasons. People in Silicon Valley aren't religious and they are pretty young too. He says this, I believe faith brings about charity. There is a charitable aspect that faith uniformly induces into people, into their consciousness. So the lack of a faith tradition creates a lack of philanthropic tradition. The reason why I read this article is this. To be Christian is to give. To be Christian is to give. To be Christian is to give. Not just money, but time, attention, bordering, choosing to rip off callousness that you have put up inside, choosing to be with the least of these, these. choosing to look at a vile, evil person and saying, There is hope, there is forgiveness, there is grace found in Jesus, when you come to His altar, you find forgiveness. Are you willing to do so? Are you willing to be His hands, His feet? Perhaps the way we get to know the head of the church is when we choose to be a part of His body. We become His hands and feet. And so we're going to take a moment and want every eye to be closed. And I've said a a chunk of things this morning, but what I want to pray for this morning is for a fresh passion and desire to know God. Perhaps, you know, you are like the people I've described now. You are only in church because out of a fear of eternal damnation. Perhaps you were coerced here. Perhaps you were tricked here. I cannot tell you that there is so much more to the gospel, so much more to Christ than just an escape plan. There is beauty, there is glory, there is worth waiting to be found by those who will pursue Him, those who will endeavor to know Him, those who will choose to find Him in fellowship, those who will choose to be still before Him, be willing to embrace weakness, those who will choose to suffer with the hurting and the broken. With the goal of finding Him, of knowing Him, of going to the places where He will be. So this morning, with every eye closed, with every head bowed, if that is you, you want to be pushed and trusted, you want the grace of God to come upon you this morning, to cause you to have a fresh hunger, passion and desire to know Him. And you're saying, I'm willing to do all it takes. I'm willing to step out of my comfort. I'm willing to go where I need to go. If that is you this morning, you say, I want to know you, God, beyond what I've already come to know. I want you to gently lift your hands. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I want you to do so this morning knowing that the veil has been torn away. That Christ, as He uttered that final word on the cross, it is finished. As He gave up His Spirit, He tore that veil of separation and it didn't just stop there. Christ was buried in a grave and in three days He rose again. Our Christ is risen and He's within you waiting to be known waiting to be discovered so Jesus we thank you for the privilege of knowing you Lord we thank you for the cross of Calvary that that creates that pathway that way of knowing you that which was inaccessible in the days of old that which was shrouded in mystery we get to partake of freely God we ask that you stir up fresh gratitude and thankfulness for what the Savior has accomplished for us on the cross that we may be truly saved.
not just to the point of escaping damnation, but saved into the knowledge of you. Thank you and we love you.